Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Udo Bolt Gear Kit. Now in the past I have done a review and a few other videos on the Udo Bolt V8 and that's the same board that comes with this, but they're selling this as a full kit now for $399 on their website. And I've had a few viewers ask me to take a look at the new gear kit. Now before we get started here, I do want to mention that I paid out of pocket for this kit here. I got it on their website. $399 plus I think it was like $40 shipping, so everything you're going to see in this video is close to $440. So this kit comes with a Udo Bolt V8, it also comes with a metal case, Wi-Fi module, and your power supply. In order to get this up and running properly, you're still going to have to add your own SODIMM RAM and storage. You can use M.2, or if you opt for their SATA kit, you can use a 2.5 inch hard drive or SSD. So obviously the kit isn't complete, you still need to add that RAM and storage. But inside of the box you're going to get a US plug and a European plug, plus your 65 watt power supply, and they've also included the metal case, or the Udo Bolt case. And personally I'm a big fan of this, I think it looks pretty awesome, and it kind of gives it an Intel NUC feel. All of the most important ports are accessible from the outside of this case when everything's put together, and they give you a power button and all the hardware you need to mount the Udo Bolt inside of here. But the main bread and butter to this whole kit is the Udo Bolt V8 itself. And if you're not familiar with the Bolt, this is touted as being the world's most powerful maker board, and in my experience, this is a pretty powerful little maker board. It's actually powered by an AMD Ryzen embedded V1605B. We have four cores and eight threads with a boost up to 3.6 gigahertz. And this model here is known as the Bolt V8 because we have Radeon Vega 8 graphics built in. As for basic I.O. on the board, moving from the left to the right, we have a 3.5mm audio jack, two full-size HDMI ports, two USB Type-C ports, and these can be used for data or video out, so we can actually connect a total of four displays to this little board. We also have Gigabit Ethernet and our power input. Taking a look at the front of the board, we have two USB 3.0 ports and another audio jack up front here. Now this is not including all of the other I.O. that's on this board here. We have a ton of GPIO pins over here and this is fully compatible with the Arduino Leonardo layout. We have three Grove connectors, our SATA data connector and our SATA power connector in case you want to connect a SATA drive, 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch will work just fine with this. Overall, as a development board, this thing is fully loaded, and I will leave the full specs in the description. There's just way too much to go over in one video with this. But I have to say, the main claim to fame to the Udo Bolt V8 is the CPU and GPU combination it's running. For a board that's 4.72 inches by 4.72 inches, this is definitely packing some serious power. Because this is running an AMD Ryzen embedded V1605B. This is a quad-core CPU with 8 threads at a base clock of 2 GHz and a boost up to 3.6. We also have that built-in AMD Radeon Vega 8 up to 1100 MHz, but I do have to mention that while I'm gaming with this, I've never seen the GPU jump up to 1100 MHz. It's always in between 400 MHz and 800 MHz in certain games. And as for memory, you do have to add your own. It uses DDR4 SODIMM. It's set up in a dual-channel mode with support for ECC, up to 32 gigabytes at 2400 megahertz. Taking a look at the bottom here, we do have three M.2 slots. We have a M.2 key E, an M.2 key B, and an M.2 key M. Two of these are going to work for NVMe SSDs or just regular old M.2 SSDs if that's what you want to use. And one of them can be used for accessories like the Wi-Fi module that's included with the Udo Bolt gear. And as for the setup we're going to be using in this video, I'm going to go with 16 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance at 2400 megahertz, along with a 256 gigabyte Western Digital Black M.2 drive. I've got the RAM and the storage installed on the VA. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the case that was included with the Bolt Gear kit. I personally really like this little case here. It's super easy to use. But if you do want to access the M.2, you will have to remove the board. There's no access to the bottom of the board while it's in the case. And once it's all assembled, you'll have something that looks like this. I think this is a really nice looking mini PC. We can access all of the GPIO on the side, your SATA data and your SATA power, plus those Grove connectors. We got the USB on the front and full access to all of the back I.O. And the kit does include a power button. You're just going to plug it into the header on the inside and that'll act as your power on, power off and reset. Okay, so I've installed Windows 10 Pro, updated all the drivers, I got a bunch of applications to test here, but real quick, we have that Ryzen Embedded V1605B, 4 cores, 8 threads, base clock is 2GHz with a boost up to 3.6. 
16 gigabytes of DDR4 at 2400 megahertz, and the built-in Radeon Vega A graphics. Now I've had a little bit of issue with the GPU clocks here. If I go to, let's say graphics, you can see my core clock. This should go all the way up to 1100 megahertz. And if I do a quick test here, I can never get it to hit 1100 megahertz, no matter how much I stress it. And this is actually the highest I've seen it go here. When I'm gaming, it's anywhere from 400 up to 700, and that's all I can really get out of it. It's kind of odd, but when I run this little test here, it does go up to around 1000 every once in a while. I'm not sure if that's a limitation of the chip or drivers. But the first thing I always like to do is run a few benchmarks. This is Geekbench 5, single core, 780, multi, 2372. And I do have a few other chips to test this against. Like the 3500U coming in with a single core score of 844, multi-core of 2525, the 2400G with a single core of 826, and a multi of 2814. And finally, the 3400G with a single core of 1006 and a multi of 3895. I gotta say, this little chip is actually hanging with its big brothers pretty well. Next up, we have 3D Mark Time Spy. Total score on this little machine, 736. Graphics score, 658. CPU score, 2293. Now, I wanted to face this off with another AMD chip that has built-in Vega 8 graphics, so I went with the 3200G. Total score, 1089, graphic score, 975, and CPU score, 3269. Now, I do have to admit that the 3200G is a desktop processor and it consumes much more power than this embedded unit, but it is possible to build a PC with that chip for around the same price as you can pick up the Udo Bolt. But now I want to turn our attention to 4K video playback, be it streaming or native. So the first thing we're going to do is head over to YouTube. I always use this video here because it is an open source movie free to use. 4K, we do have a few drop frames, and I do notice this when everything's buffering out, but overall, this little chip here definitely handles 4K 60F video playback really, really well, be it streaming or native. And out of a thousand frames, we've dropped 22. It could be a little better with Chrome. I'm actually using the new Edge browser, but you'd never notice this. I mean, just 23 drop frames out of almost 2,000. Not bad at all. The next test I want to run is with Plex here, and this has been a really hard one to run with lower end systems. We're going to go to more, get info. This is 4K, only 30 FPS, but it's 83 megabits. We're going to see if it can do it here. I'm pretty sure it's going to handle it. And I've had ARM single board computers and some x86 CPUs kind of crash trying to do this. At least the app would crash. But it's handling this just fine. 83 megabits per second, 4K, 30 FPS. And finally, we're going to go with native playback. This is on the internal storage using a very popular media playback app. 4K, 60 FPS. I do have all the stats listed up in the top left hand corner. And for this video here, 400 megahertz on the GPU, 1600 megahertz on the CPU, and we're getting super smooth playback, 4K 60. And if you're a regular viewer of my channel, you know this movie struggles on a lot of different devices that I've tested. So running Windows 10 on the Udo Bolt as an everyday PC works out really well. It's super quiet. Actually, I was actually surprised at how quiet the fan is. It doesn't kick on as much as I thought it would. Web browsing is smooth. We got good WebGL performance here. Go up to 5,000. We're at 60. 10,000, it starts to struggle a little bit. If we go to 30, it's around 23. I mean, not a lot of people are going to be using this much power with WebGL. But overall, it's really not that bad for how low powered this CPU is. But now it's time to move over to some PC gaming and see how this performs. So first on the list, we have CSGO, 1080p, low settings. Now, I was actually expecting a little more out of this board at 1080p, low settings with this game here. But we're sitting around 46 FPS. I would definitely drop this down to 720p.
So here's OG Skyrim, medium settings, 1080p, and this is the only game I could ever get that GPU to boost up past 800 megahertz, or past 700 at least. And again, I was pretty surprised that we couldn't get a constant 60 out of this with this older Skyrim game, medium settings, 1080p. Now I'm sure it would do it at low settings, but I wanted to get a little more out of it. Here we have Dauntless, low settings, 720p, we're getting an average of around 35 to 37 FPS here. I do have the resolution scale set to 100%, but keep in mind I am at 720. And again, with the Vega 8 GPU, base clock on this is supposed to be set at 1100 MHz, but we're only seeing around 500 MHz with this game here. We have GTA 5 normal settings 1080p. I was really interested in the 1080p performance here, and we're getting around 30 FPS, which really isn't bad. You can lock this and play it like this all day, but if you want a little more out of it, definitely drop it down to 720. At 720, we're getting an average of around 47 to 48 FPS. And finally, we have Doom Eternal. This is an online match, and by the way, I got absolutely destroyed with this one. Low settings, Vulcan back in, 720p. I do see it dip down below 30 every once in a while when there's a lot going on, but overall, I mean, you can get over 30 FPS with this one. So I can say that the Udo Bolt Gear Kit definitely puts out some decent power for its size and power draw. And speaking of power draw, I did do a test. I'm using a kilowatt meter from the wall. And this is overall power consumption of the full PC. Idle, 12.4 watts. 4K video playback. Now this is native playback, 15.3 watts. And for my extreme test, which consists of running 3D Mark Time Spy and Cinebench R15 at the same exact time, we only pulled 33.8 watts from the wall. And at 720p gaming, it averages around 28 watts. So I have to say, I mean, this definitely does a great job for how much power it's pulling. But that's going to wrap up this video. I will have a couple more coming out. I'm going to do a full emulation test with a ton of different emulators, and I also want to get a Linux test out of the way. This is something I haven't done on the Bolt V8, and I definitely wanted to test it out. But like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I have done some other tests, like adding an external GPU and things like that. I'll leave a playlist in the description if you're interested in checking those videos out. And if there's anything else you'd like me to test with the Bolt Gear, just let me know in the comments below. It could be an application for Windows or Linux or a specific operating system. But that's it for this one. I really appreciate you watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.